Hello everyone, welcome to Mo Stories and on the second part of my Montreal adventures. I'm not going to be talking too much more about the goof on the, in these stories. He might appear here and there in a little, in a little bit, maybe. But I want to tell you about some other cool things that did happen while I was in Montreal. Now, as you know, if you watched my previous episode, my previous part there, the part one, I... Every once in a while, I kind of slummed it a little bit. I was on, basically, on the streets, but not on the streets. I stayed at shelters here and there. I, I, I went on social assistance for a little bit here and there. But, you know, I, I was, I, even today, even though I have a, a decent job and I have a decent apartment that, I still will go and eat at soup kitchens and that. But this first story is when I was living, and I'm pretty sure it was a, a, a shelter called the Oldbury Mission in Montreal. And and now with this shelter, it, it was, I remember that it was one, when you slept, when you stayed there at night to, and you got your bed, it was a big room, one one big room that had bunk beds. I, I There must have been at least 50 people in that one big room that you that you when you get your bunk and so one day I was sitting on, on I was sitting on I was on the top bunk I was sitting there just I had my stuff with me and everything and and I was waiting you know I want to keep my bunk to to so that, that nobody else would take it and I wasn't going anywhere. I had music with me. I had I was listening to music at the time and that. And I saw this guy. He had a laptop, and he was he and he had it in his hands, and he was looking around, looking around, looking around. And I'm I'm sure he was he he had to go somewhere for a few hours, and he couldn't bring his laptop with him. So as he's looking around and. I must have I must have looked in a certain way because as soon as as soon as he saw me he came right straight to me to me and he handed me the co computer and said could you look after this for a few hours you're the only person in this whole place that looks trustworthy and I was like I was honored of course because I was that type of person I'm a very trustworthy and honest person and I said yeah okay no problem so for about two hours, I had the I had the computer there. I think I, maybe I might have been drawing too, listening to music and drawing at the time. But yeah, he was able to leave that computer with me, and and no problem. He he came back about two two and a half hours later. The computer was still in perfect condition. I never touched it. I didn't open it up. I just kept it on the side there, and. I had that reputation of being a trustworthy, honest person. I'm not, I'm, I was like, I felt like I was always a little bit of ahead of the curve. Yes, even though I was considered homeless and that, I was a smart enough guy. It's just that I had bad luck sometimes. Things would come around and I would, I would find myself in, in just bad situations. Now, now this is something that I had noticed, okay, that most people wouldn't notice. At, also at the Oldbury Mission, they had a shower. When you, when you first get there to sign in for the night, you had to go and take a shower. And their showers were like, if you remember, if you've seen the first It movie, like the, the, the one that was made for TV with uh, Tim Curry and that, you remember that part where, where I think Eddie was taking a shower in that big kind of big shower room, the part where the Pennywise comes out of the drain and terrorizes little poor little Eddie. Anyway, picture that type of shower, where it's just like four different walls, and you had the shower heads all lined up. So you're taking a shower, pretty much like a like it was like a a locker room like for for gym and stuff those those types of showers and now how how they worked of course is you had this 
you had the button and the shower head was kind of up high overhead and you had to press these you had to press the button and it gave you like 30 seconds of shower and then it would stop you press the button again you get 30 more seconds of shower every single person was doing that hitting the button shower stops press the button again but not me i figured out like instantly the very first time that i used those showers that if you kept your hand and i it didn't bother me washing with one hand but if you kept your hand on that button the whole time there would be a steady stream and the water would stay warmer that way and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to keep pressing the button. I, I liked having a steady stream. Nobody seemed to figure that out. Nobody saw that I was doing that. Nobody picked up on it. They're all stuck in their own world. But I was observing everybody around me and, 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 and wondering, why aren't they doing it this way? I, I could keep one hand, and if I, when I need to wash the other side and that, I could change hands. I turn around and change hands and keep the button pre pressed a steady stream the whole time it's little things like that that stick with you all these years that i remember why aren't people noticing that why aren't people doing that too am i the only one that sees these things anyway i digress on that it, it just it was a weird interesting time i my brain was on high alert all the time trying being aware of what was around me but something i was not aware of at the time and and i'm not sure exactly the name of the i don't want to if i i think i remember the the soup kitchen that this happened at but i i don't want to name what place it was there was a time and i only found out about this several years later but from the from a news article that I had read and I was sure that I was there eating at that soup kitchen at the time when this event was happening they were they were they were supposed to but they were serving us zebra meat from a zebra so it was it was a big scandal that was happening and I remember reading that article and like Oh my goodness, I was eating there at the time, and I'm very sure, very sure that I had eaten zebra meat, zebra meat, without without even realizing it. You, Because it tastes like meat, but it was a weird meat, I remember at the time. People were questioning it, well, what kind of meat was that? And they didn't, they said, oh yeah, it's just, uh, it was, uh... I think they said it was other type of meat, like a like game meat, like you know either deer or moose or something like that. They didn't want to admit that it was zebra meat, but they found out that for 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 a few years they were getting zebra meat, and that's what we were eating. I tell you, those times that we I spent in the homeless shelters and uh, and in eating at soup kitchens were some weird 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 times. And I do have more stories about stuff like that, but I have a couple more parts to the story that I will say for future episodes. I'm not sure how many episodes I'm going to be making, probably like three or four, because there are a lot of stories that happen, but I don't. I want to spread them out here and there, and I don't want to get, and some stuff is a little bit more personal. I have to, I have to kind of, feel how I feel about telling these stories eventually because there, there's some embarrassing stories or stories I'm kind of uncomfortable with but I'm trying to overcome my insecurities so I probably will tell those particular stories eventually just not right now again sorry for cutting off my head up there I want every time I lean in like I the screen is cutting off my head but so I want to actually change change stories a little bit. Now, when I first moved up there, it was it was 2001. It was January 5th, two days before my my 30th birthday when and I had found an apartment. 
I was still dating my, I was still going out with uh, my, my, my girlfriend Carolyn at the time. Even when I was slumming it on the streets here and there, I still would go and, and see her and we still had a relationship and everything. But I remember we, I had a place, I think it was up by uh, Trois Rivières, which is the uh, Three Rivers. A little north. It's, this was when I was actually working at Vito's Metal. The big metal shop. Which I will tell a couple stories about that maybe too. If I can think of them. But we, I had a, 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 a... Like I was in the top floor of an apartment complex. And, and there was a... We had a balcony and everything. And I remember... I remember putting like... When, when my roommate, which I will just go, I'll, I won't say his name, but I will give the initials. It, it was SW. And I will talk a little bit about SW in, in, in future stories. Because this guy was, seemed cool, seemed like a really cool dude at first. but And his wackiness and weirdness kind of is, is part of this story too. But this was the day... Of 9-11 okay September 11th 2001 and what a weird day that was certain events was taking places place that I was not aware of at the time with me and my roommate not with the event that happened that day but I remember that morning we had gotten up really early we were probably up at like seven eight o'clock in the morning and he came in and he had the most green but I'm gonna call it green I won't call it the other stuff you, you know what I'm talking about the green it probably was at the time some of the strongest and most potent and he had a huge bag of it and how he came about that bag I will get to at the end of this little story but but all that morning we we didn't have the TV on we were we were trying to make a business together where we were taking, we were going and buy these blocks of soapstone and with like with, with a saw and Dremel drill and stuff. We were trying, we were trying to make these cool pipes. I mean, we had the sandpaper and the oil to oil them up and we were trying to make these, these, and they were not the best quality. They were, because it's soapstone, they they would break, you had to take care of it because it would break easy. But here we were trying to make these really intricate pipes and everything. And and we were trying to vent the vent the, the, the dust from it outside, blowing it, trying to have a fan and blowing it outside and everything. He was a little bit obsessive. I, I, cause he wanted money all the time, all the time, all the time. And me, I was kind of like, okay, I need money, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stress out over it like he was. And yeah, this guy had some serious problems and I will get to that in future stories. But, but I sort of noticed that, like, cause where the place was, we would have planes fly over probably every half an hour, like boom, pretty low enough. And I loved watching the planes go by. And I was always aware of the planes going by, like right over the apartment building. Like, like so low enough that you feel that you would actually hear the rumble and stuff. Because it was just perfectly in line with the airport. But that day in particular, we were noticing that, I was noticing that, hey, where are all the airplanes? Like, there's not a single plane that went over today. Something's weird happening. And by the time that I realized what was happening, it was already like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The event had already happened. So I'm on the balcony, and we had some neighbors that was on the next next over and down and a cool a cool black black people were living there but they were really cool people and I, I liked them and we were asking i was like what's going on why isn't there any planes going over it, it, it's really strange because i'm always noticing the planes and there's no planes and they said well you haven't you been watching the news and mind you i was so stoned that day I was baked out of my mind 
And, and yeah, so we turned on the TV finally at like 3 something in the afternoon and couldn't believe what we were seeing when, you know, Tower 1, Tower 2, like the, watching the events pretty much kind of as they happened, but it was later in the afternoon. It was the most, like, I will never forget that day, what we were doing, how I felt about it. And I couldn't help myself. I kind of laughed at, at the TV thing and all those, like, it, like, not because of the tragedy, because it was a big tragedy, and I felt bad for the for those people who who perished in that in that event. But I sort of laughed. I was laughing at at the Americans, like the American government. I'm like, all oh, you stupid, stupid people, you know? Did, didn't you guys like the way you were going about policies and all that stuff? Because it was all in the news previously. Just the way they were, I I, I, I blame the Americans. I blame this the Americans for for letting for letting that happen and and and, and their stupidity and their just because we, in a weird way, me and my and my roommate at the time we were, we predicted that we figured that was going to happen. We. Because because the news events were just leading up to that. It's like, like didn't you train these people in the first place? Didn't your military kind of train these people? And I mean the not the people that sui that they well I'm not gonna use that word either. But that that just ruined their lives, you know, for the pros. Well, you know, you know the story. I'm not gonna go into the 9/11 story. But that event that day, I was, yeah, of course we were laughing at the Americans because we were stoned. We were baked out of our mind. We, we didn't really get the full story at the time, but we blamed, we were like laughing at the Americans saying, you guys are stupid. We kind of seen that coming and you guys didn't. You guys, and the way they were behaving as if it was a total shock to them how could this happen but you guys knew you guys knew that was going to happen somehow some way but yeah that's kind of what happened that day that whole morning we were now how we came about getting all that weed and and just to show that you can't trust certain people People say put on this good fake front of I'm this and I'm that But what happened and when I found out that like basically later on that day is when I found out that Because I usually went to pay the rent I usually like like we collect the money from my roommate and but this time I was because I had to work like the couple of days before that it was because that on september 11 it was my day off and we were there making those pipes and stuff and and smoking that weed well the green and and yeah how he came about that is that he actually i sent him to go and pay the rent and i thought the rent was paid but nope he took that money the money we and we had no money for paying that rent because he took all the rent money and bought that big bag of weed because he's he was he was addicted to weed. I could have went without it if I didn't have it. It didn't bother me. I wasn't I wasn't as a, as addicted to it as he was. But yeah, he ended up taking all that rent money and spending it on weed. So it was like, oh my God, I, I I tried to avoid the landlord after that, and like I didn't know what to do. I had so again, I had to try to find a place to live or be on the streets, and eventually, uh, I, I it came about that I had to move out, had to sell some of my stuff or whatever, and I didn't have a lot of stuff in the first place. But yeah, I pretty much found myself on the streets because I. Because he spent all that rent money, all the money I saved up from work and stuff. And no, I think, no, I wasn't, I didn't go homeless at that time. I think I went on UI because, because 
I had to quit that that Vito's metal job because my nerves were shot because 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 they were not safe and everything. Yeah, I think I went on uh, social assistance and I was staying at the men's shelter at the time. So yeah, technically, te technically homeless. But anyway, but yeah, that's how I uh, that those events happen. I found out later that day on that day of September 11th that yeah. I would I I had I had to I had to vacate that premises because we couldn't pay the rent and we didn't I and the pay the oh yeah we would have been behind we we left without telling the landlord so I I I I hate when stuff like that happens because I'm try I really try to do the right thing to be trustworthy and to to honor my debts and and pay my debts whenever possible but when situations like that happen, sometimes you're forced, forced to go about it in a deceitful way, and and I still kind of feel ashamed about that even to this day. But you know, things happen, and I'm I'm sure I'm forgetting certain details. I'm not saying certain details right, but that is pretty much my memory of that day of what happened. Now I kind of. I will probably try to talk about this more when when the memories do clear up a little bit more in future videos. But I want to switch gears and, and try to leave this on a positive note. And I want to talk about certain celebrities. Celebrities I had either met or seen in Montreal. And, and when you grow up in, in, in Moncton, New Brunswick here, pretty much most of, you, most of your life, and then you move into a big city for the first time, I had never actually seen a celebrity in, 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 in sight. The only celebrity I had actually ever seen before moving to Montreal was James Best, who played Roscoe Pico trained in the Dukes of Hazzard TV series. When he was, he was there... Signing autographs and like when they were promoting the General Lee, the, the car, and, and a car show. It was at the Moncton Coliseum. It was a car show. He They had the General Lee. And you can meet the actor James Best that played, that played Roscoe Pico Train. Before moving to Montreal, he was the only celebrity I had seen. Now, this first celebrity sighting took place... I say within uh, when I was still living on St. Andre when I was just first going out with my with my new girlfriend um, Carolyn her yeah her name was Carolyn and and we were walking down St. Andre and there was like on the street as I'm walking down the street with with her didn't there was these movie trailers and they they had this this one house fenced off they were shooting an episode of of the TV series charmed you know that had uh, Shannon Dor Doherty I believe Alyssa Milano was on the show at the time and so on and so forth but didn't Shannon Doherty come come with a little entourage uh, i think it was her like makeup artist a, a couple of people were next to her but she came out of the trailer and walked right right by us as me and me and carolyn were walking down the street now carolyn didn't under, didn't know who she was because she never watched the show before and she doesn't know uh english actors she's like she's french and only knows french tv shows and that but here I am, like as as we walked by her, I, I I nudged I nudged Carolyn on the shoulder, and I'm like I'm like that's Shannon Doherty, and I said it loud enough so that she could hear me, the actress. That was my first real sighting, like in the wild. I couldn't believe that she was right there on the street, walking right next to me. It was a bit of a cool moment for me because, wow, I'm actually seeing like. Uh, uh, an actor that I recognize that I've seen in Beverly Hills 90210 and seen her on Charmed because I did watch those shows every now and then and it, it kind of blew my mind that wow you I, I guess you really can see see those kind of movies here like like see celebrities in that 
I thought that was something. I thought that was like an interesting first celebrity sighting. Now, my second celebrity sighting was actually when I was going to, uh, I was walking down St. Catherine Street, right right across the street from Music Plus, which is the French version of Much Music, which is a cool music channel that I used to watch a lot, like pretty much all the time. Most of my, anytime I had a TV on, it was Music Plus. Now, I couldn't, I didn't have time to stop to talk to the celebrity because I really wanted to because there was a limited time to get to the soup kitchen because if I wasn't at that soup kitchen that day at that time I would have had to wait another five hours to be able to eat and I was kind of hungry and I wanted to eat but if I would have been able to have the time if I wasn't on my way there I would have stopped to talk to the celebrity wouldn't it be Paul Lee Shore who if you if you know from the movies like uh, like Encino Man and join the army and stuff like that I, I, and other and other movies where he play a character called weasel and he goes buddy well it was Polly Shore and he was holding a sign that said come see my movie Polly Shore is dead all I had a chance to say to him is like hey, you know have a like it was it's cool seeing you out here you know uh, like I'm a big fan you know a big fan but I knew who he was and I and like recognized him immediately well he was holding a sign saying Polly Shore is dead you know promoting his new movie I again I really wish that I was able to go and and, and talk to him I wish I would have had more time because I would have asked him some questions and and, 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 like, get to talk to a celebrity in the wild on the standing. And nobody, nobody else paid attention to him. Everybody that walked by, it was like an everyday thing. They, like, it was almost like they didn't know who he was. But I thought that was, I thought that was a cool, my second celebrity sighting. My third celebrity sighting was when I was living still within this, pretty much within the same time period. This was all within a year, of uh, in a year, a year of a, of a span. Because I, I was still going out with, with Carolyn. I was at her, I was at her place up in Ville Anjou, and I had the radio on, listening to a cool rock and roll station. And didn't they announce that? Um, Robert De Niro and Francis McDermott, McDermott was going to be promoting their uh, movie called uh, City by the Sea. And I forget the exact time. I think it might have been 2002 or two, yeah, maybe, maybe early 2003 when I heard this announcement saying that he was going to be there, like, like on a panel, like, and I had I had maybe a, a, about a, about forty five minutes to get there to to, to 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 see this thing. So I I ended up having to beg my 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 girlfriend at the time to borrow her bus pass because she had a, a a monthly bus pass. I didn't, but I said, "Can I borrow your pass? I need I need to go and and actually see Robert De Niro in person. I had to." Even though I couldn't get that, I wasn't that close enough. To, but close enough, at least maybe a good thirty feet away from 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 where he was uh, sitting. So I'm beelined my way down to Complex de Jardin because that's where it was happening. They had they had the, uh, like a stage set up and a nice barrier, and they had all these seats in front of it where the reporters would. And they were only taking questions from reporters because I would have asked a couple of questions. I forget the questions I wanted to ask, but I would have asked a couple of questions. So while we were waiting for the, the panel to start, I was standing in a place by the barrier, just 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 enough that I could see in, in like through the curtain. And the curtain was opened up just enough that I could see Robert De Niro sitting there waiting to come on the stage. And I can tell you, it was the coolest thing. It's like, 
like first seeing Robin De Niro in person, like no TV screen between us or no movie screen between us. Just I, I could see him sitting there and he looked so cool because he was sitting there and his head was cocked to the side like this. I, I think somebody was talking to him off just off the side that I couldn't see because he was kind of nodding his head a little bit looking around making the Robert De Niro face the oh it like it was it was awesome and then and then he comes and then when they introduced him he would come on he would come onto the stage and and the, and Francis McDiarmid was there right sitting next to him and and, and the director now it was also a movie that had um, had Jane Franco in it, but Jane Franco wasn't there at the time. So here I had two celebrities I was seeing for like like two movie stars and movie stars, like the biggest movies, two of the bigger bigger movie stars, especially Robert De Niro. But it was awesome seeing Frances McDormand there also. Like I couldn't believe you know because I had seen her in Fargo, I had seen her in, in other things here and there. So yeah, that's how I got to see see Robert De Niro and Francis McDormand. Those those were my third celebrity sighting. My fourth celebrity sighting, or 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 fifth. Okay, fifth celebrity sighting because you can count Francis and uh, and Robert in 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 the same in in the same category because they were the same place. But the the, the next celebrity sighting that I I seen and probably my last celebrity sighting was was um, going next. I was walking down the street and there was a whole bunch of people gathered in front of Brown, a place called Brown's Shoe Store, a shoe store, and they were all crowded around the, this this window. And I'm like, I'm going by. I'm like, who 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 are you guys waiting for? And they were all like, oh, Paris Hilton. Paris Hilton is going to be coming to. To sign autographs, she's in the store, and you know she's promoting a new shoe and stuff. And I wasn't really a big Paris Hilton fan, but you know I will never pass down an opportunity to even a minor celebrity like that, because I I known her from the the Simple Life or the, that show she did with Nicole Simpson, and. And so yeah, okay. I I I I stay. I I had a good view. I was I was at a good part of the window, and I was right next to the window. And there were other people trying to get a view, but I was I was there early enough to. And I had and I waited a good half an hour just to see Paris Hilton, and then sure enough, there she was inside the like. I I seen her through a some glass, but still she was there in person, Paris Hilton. Coming, coming out from the back, and then, and then, I could see her quite far enough away, but but still clearly, I could see that it was her, and she she had a box of shoes, and she was signing autographs, and and then she eventually came down the stair because she was up on the balcony, kind of like a balcony part of the store. Then she come down the stairs and got a little closer, and waved to the people behind the glass. And yeah, so I got to see Paris Hilton that day. So those are some of the celebrity sightings that I saw in Montreal. And before this this uh, video gets a little too long, I'm kind of going to leave it there at that. And so those are some some little stories that I I wanted to tell in this segment. Not no, I guess I didn't talk about the goof at the time at this time. But he will be prominent in more of the stories coming up. I do have, uh, I do, I do have made a, a quick list here of other stories I want to tell. I'll refine that. So I probably have about maybe two, th uh, yeah, two more episodes to go through. Uh, little events here and there. Nothing as spectacular as my first story I told on on my on part one, which I will be leaving right up here in the corner at the end of the video, soon. So, as always, I'm gonna leave it here. Please be safe. Take care. I will see you on the flip side, and please have a great day, evening, night, wherever you may be. Peace, everyone. <laughs>